Um, uh, how do I go about this? How does it work? Uh, why should I podcast? Why shouldn't I uh, podcast? Um, now, what that meant is I, I looked for those questions myself, and, and the most valuable answers actually came from other podcast hosts to, 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 to learn from their experiences, which is why the setup of this webinar is structured exactly like that, is to, to, to learn from those podcast hosts. Now, whilst discussing this setup, I met up with uh, Catherine Fortin, the, the co-organizer of, um, of this webinar. She's an associate professor in uh, public international law and human rights law, also at this university. And she's the project leader of the Legal Skills Academy, uh, which is a, a project of the Utrecht University's law school, um, which fits in nicely with these type of skills or whatever you would call them in terms of podcasting. Um, I'll, I'll let her introduce herself a, a little bit more extensively uh, in a minute. Um, before we kick off uh, properly, um, just a, a brief thing. I think everyone's kind of gotten used to online meetings by now, but for this webinar, all, all microphones are tuned or turned off. Um, if you have questions, please do feel free to ask them. Um, uh, of course, the podcast host will consecutively share some of their experiences, but we're here to help, I suppose, um, if we can. And that's, uh, I think, particularly in these weird corona times, uh, some of you might be exploring uh, questions, um, or maybe you're already thinking about starting a podcast, or because of working from home now, you're thinking maybe this is the time to do something with this in terms of education or in my research to get it across to a broader audience. Perhaps some of those reasons might have motivated you to to, to participate. So ask those questions. Um, how do you do that? Um, if you move your cursor across the screen in uh, in Microsoft Teams, you'll see a toolbar pop up, um, and if you then go to the um, to the meeting chat. You can, um, you can type your questions there. Now, during the meeting, uh, Catherine Fortin and I will um, somewhat gently interrupt the speakers um, and raise, raise their awareness uh, um, about these questions. Uh, so please feel free to ask them as, as this webinar goes, goes on. Um, uh, the, this webinar is being recorded, uh, so if you have colleagues or uh, that would like to listen to the to the webinar afterwards, please feel free to to forward the link, uh, which will be posted on the website of Utrecht University after this uh, this seminar. Um, let's move on to uh, the schedule for this meeting. Um, we have until about five o'clock, so about two hours. Um, uh, Catherine and I will start off with uh, what we call podcasting for dummies. We didn't mean that in any harm's way, but perhaps there's some basic things that we can still clarify. We'll try to keep that section relatively brief, um, but uh, because we're particularly interested in hearing from, from the other podcast hosts. Um, and then we'll close off with um, uh, how to podcast at Utrecht University. Um, and that is done by René Hendricks. He works at the audiovisual services of this university. Um, and, and before I forget, please, please allow me to also introduce the other podcast hosts. Uh, we have Vincent Krone joining us. He's an associate professor of media studies at the humanities faculty of this university. And um, he's actually, he po started podcasting before it was cool, I think. Um, many years ago, he's raising his fist. That's excellent to see. Um, I, over 100 episodes, I think. Um, he puts uh, the other podcast hosts, including myself, to shame, I think. Um, but of course, we'll also be sharing some of our, uh, our some of our experiences in the other podcast hosts sharing uh, some of those thoughts are um, Bob Richens and Gazale Dabiran from About Law podcast. Um, uh, the first one is the show host and the other one is the producer. Now, they're lawyers with a long, extensive careers in all the different types of um, uh, fields of law and, and, and uh, expertise. But today they'll be sharing their experiences with about about law podcast. Now, the idea of that section is obviously to, to talk about why, how, when, how do you do it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I've asked the speakers today to be to be honest, uh, what went well and what didn't go well, because I think that's where we learn uh, probably or hopefully uh, the most. Um, now, before we get started uh, with the first section of, of, uh, of this, this uh, meetup, the podcasting for Dumb section, what I'd like you to do is uh, in the meeting chat, uh, so if you could all open it um, now, Please share some, uh, perhaps where, three things. Uh, where are you currently working from? What's the institution you're based at? And um, 
what is your podcast status, if, that's, um, if that means anything? What I'd like to know is, are you thinking about starting a podcast? Is it something that is totally far-fetched and you just saw this announcement and you needed time to fill, which I can't imagine? Or is it, are you in a, in a quite an advanced stage? So please, if you would be able to share that in the meeting chat, um, that would be great. I see some, thank you for your response. I see some initial things coming in. Brand new in this field. Uh, Brianne's saying that she's exploring to, or planning even want to start one, two even. Uh, great enthusiasm there. Then we've got someone logging in from, from Aruba. Uh, communication scholar, absolute beginner. Associated with the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, but working from the Netherlands, thinking about starting one. Someone that's curious. No experience, but uh, thinking about podcasting, it's great. Thank you for sharing all of this. This is very valuable information and also, I think, uh, useful for, for the other speakers before they before they start. Um, and then we've got Stephanie also logging in from the pro program Public Engagement, helping researchers. Um, but she has recorded one once. Marion saying she wants to implement it in, in, re in, in education. That's a, it's an interesting thing. Eh? So... Of course, we can. Uh, we'll discuss this in a bit, but there are aspects about um, uh, where podcasts can actually be used in both research and education, and they can actually be used simultaneously. So I'm sure that Vincent has probably uh, used some of his podcasts in his in his courses. I've done the same. But we'll get back into that a little bit a bit later on. Um, please keep sharing those. Uh, but at least now you've found the question uh, question box. So if you have questions, just do the same as what you just did um, and, and please share them with, uh, with us. All right, let's, um, let's move on to the podcasting for dummies uh, section. And I, I think I'll give the floor to, to Catherine first and maybe she can um, um, introduce something as well about the Legal Skills Academy. Great, thanks, Willem. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so as Willem said, I first um, got well in touch with Willem because uh, in my work for the Legal Skills Academy at Utrecht University, where we're looking to figure out different ways of integrating skills into our education, um, and we were aware that um, some teachers were wanting to use podcasts as part of their education um, as a method of delivering information, but also seeking to find out whether students might be able to make podcasts as um, a kind of assignment. So knowing that Willem had a podcast and having read his uh, a, a, a blog post that he wrote at some point about some of the challenges of making podcasts, I, I, I hunted him down and then fired questions at him for about an hour over coffee, um, many of which we're going to cover in this podcast. So. Um, I knew already what a podcast is. Um, my 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 status, my podcast status, as you call it, is that I'm an avid listener of podcasts. I listen to them a lot. I've also been interviewed in podcasts, but I haven't made them. Um, though I am in a group of researchers who are wanting to set up a series of podcasts. So this is also very val valuable to have um, these three hosts who have already done it so we can hear what went well, what didn't go well. Um, I'm sure you all know uh, we've written some questions here, some of which we're going to cover in the meeting um, and some of which we're going to run through now. I'm sure all of you are here um, know what podcasts are, but just to give the official summary, they're um, of course digital audio files and that's what makes them uh, different to uh, video clips, for example, and they're available on the internet for downloading. Um, most people listen to them on mobile phones, but you can also, of course, listen to them on your computer. Um, most podcasts are available as series, um, and one of the great things of listening to them on platforms like Podcast Addict, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, is that you get the new installments automatically um, when they're available. 
Um, so that's what podcasts are. Um, how and when do you listen to them? Bill, and when do you listen to podcasts? A oh, good question, actually. I was going to ask you, but I'll get to that in a second, what your favorite podcast is. But um, I listen to them on my bike, in the car, um, particularly now working from home. I listen to them as well in the background whilst I'm working. Um, so I think that also showcases some of the benefit of, of a podcast is, is you can do it whilst doing something else as well. So that's, uh, I, I suppose, there's, it's just one medium that you can use. You can, of course, we're in academia, we're used to blogging, perhaps writing columns, more real uh, peer reviewed um, types of uh, publications, which is more of the classic academic work, of course. Um, but I think that all requires you to sit down and actually read, whereas this, you can, you know, you can do in transit, which I think is one of the main benefits. And also, if you look at statistics of when people listen, it's actually in those moments where you don't have anything else to do and you can use that time usefully. Yeah, that's exactly what I find, too. I, I listen to podcasts when I'm traveling, when I'm doing stuff around the house. Um, just whenever I have a moment that would otherwise be dead, I um, try and listen to a podcast and then um, fill it in. Um, and moving on to the topic, who makes podcasts? Well, I think, um, as we already indicated, a ton of different kinds of people make podcasts these days. Um, uh, so lecturers like us in this coronavirus, I've seen a number of lecturers putting their lectures online in podcasts. Um, many, many university institutes seem to have podcasts these days. Um, uh, some journals have podcasts. You may have seen that academic journals have podcasts that accompany a particular um, issue, uh, perhaps have an interview with an author of a particular article. That can be really nice. And, and then you have the big, the bigger networks like MP NPR or BBC. Um, you have podcasts that accompany some of the most major newspapers, of course. Yeah, and I think to add to that, I think what's what's interesting is it's something that is already massive in the US. I think in other countries it also has taken like great, or at least it's it's, it's really lifted off comparatively in the Netherlands. I think we're still at, I wouldn't say infancy stage, but it's it, it still deserves some uh, some more attention, I think. And I think now in these COVID times, perhaps the we, people will start to listen even more because ultimately that says something about I think how many listeners you will get as an academic, um, but um, yeah. So I think if we if we look at the state, the, the podcast status of the Netherlands, it's probably more the generic ones that are very popular now. Brand in Atlantis is quite those won the best podcast of last year. Um, but in terms of academia, even though you have a couple of front runners like Vincent's or about law and my podcast, which started last year, there's still a lot of it's still innovative, which I think is also could be one of the reasons to move into this uh, in this in this area. Um, but I forgot. What was your favorite podcast? Just in between. Oh, my favorite podcast. Um, well, my favorite podcast always seems to be the one I'm listening to right now. And <laughs> I've just, I just I was just actually interviewed on a podcast about my favorite podcast. It's, um, I just listened to this great podcast called My Mother's Murder, which oh. is, um, doesn't sound very jolly. It's not, but it's very interesting. It's about um, the investigation into the murder of an investigative journalist in Malta. It's just a four episodes podcast um, made very movingly by the son of the journalist. And, um, and sorry, my kids are banging on the door. <laughs> <laughs> One of the stories. <laughs> uh, um, no, so I recommend that. It's called My Mother's Murder. All right. I think for me, it's um, Freakonomics Radio. Now, this is what's interesting, right? There's also a clear distinction. There's a lot of radio programs that just put the recording online and they call that a podcast. There's some debate about whether you can actually call that a podcast or if it's just pre-recorded uh, radio. But I wouldn't get too hung up about the difference, but in terms of academia, we obviously don't, we have to make the content, which is new content, and that's the podcast then. Uh, but there's various different shapes and forms, right? You have podcasts that only last 10 minutes, and there's ones that go on for two hours. I would say in, in general, most podcasts last about between 20 and uh, 40 minutes on average, um, because that's also about the, 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 the time span that people are willing to listen to, to something. And otherwise, they really need, need to sit down. Your commute is over, for instance, and you need to come back to it. So I think that's also one of the reasons why they generally are that length. Yes. Yeah. And so one of the questions that I had to you, Willem, which I think is one of the ones we're going to explore today is, well, if so many people are making podcasts, can, can I make a podcast? 
and uh, what would it what would involve um and can i make a good one and is there any point me making a podcast if so many other people are making podcasts so i think that you know the fact that there are so many different people making podcasts and the fact they're really great and the fact they're growing as you indicated is of course wonderful for us as podcast listeners and um, the question is where does that leave us as potential podcast makers um, but I think that's something that hopefully we can we can discuss in in the in the chat um, and feeds into the last question on this this um, screen which is what impact does a podcast have and and why would you make it yeah no t totally I think uh, we will address a lot of these aspects in, in the coming uh, coming sections I do think just to, to, to jump in straight away I do think there's still so much room for new podcasts um, uh, particularly because all podcasts are different. Like even on the same topic, there's multiple podcasts very often because one does it in a very quirky way, uh, whereas academics usually take the, the more um, structured, I wouldn't say boring, but more structured approach to, 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 to podcasts. Um, and, and the content's always different. So uh, it, it, you, you can vary in terms of substance, but also in terms of format. So that all, always means that you kind of create your own um, audience in your own market for for a certain for for such a venture um shall we shall we leave it at that and then move on to to the first uh, podcast section which is uh for the sake of practical uh, presentation things which is me um uh, i'll be discussing bestek the public procurement podcast translated so bestek the understatings podcast which is something that I started uh, in January last uh, year. Um, these are the people that I've spoken to so far, which I'm very thankful to because they were the ones that were willing to jump into the deep with me um, whilst I had nothing to show for. So um, I'm, I'm grateful for them in doing that. The, the, the Bistec is a, is a, a play on words in Dutch. So it's, um, it, I didn't open a restaurant for you English speakers. Um, even though I would love to do that as well, actually. Um, uh, Bistec is a play on words. It, it refers to public procurement documents. So when a government sets out a tender, um, uh, that's in Dutch, we call that Bistec, hence, hence the cutlery, because Bistec also means cutlery in Dutch. Um, uh, so with these people, I, I've made 12, um, 12 uh, podcasts uh, so far. Um, I've got some some on the shelf already, but it's a monthly podcast. So I basically bring it out every month, and I discuss research with these um, with these these authors. So they're lawyers, they're public purchasers, they're people in the field, uh, or academics, and anyone that's really related to public procurement or public procurement law. Um, and that I find is when they when they've done interesting research that I'd love to to showcase to people, or that I'd love to discuss further. And that, I think, is also one of the reasons why I started with this deck. Um, it, it, it intends to discuss research, one. Um, and I find that's interesting as an academic, because very often podcasts are perceived as a means to reach a broader audience, right? Like the second goal is to open up reach research results. But I've also found that in nearly all episodes, by discussing their research really thoroughly, we ended up with new research results. So or new avenues to discuss, or new new thoughts. Um, sometimes small, some, sometimes a bit bigger, but it, that added value for me as well as a researcher. Um, now, one of the key things that most people obviously start a podcast for is to open up research results, right? To discuss research, perhaps as an academic, and to to go for that um, that avenue instead of say blogging or you know, on, on in addition to that, because. The advantage is, is, say, if you have a couple of hundred people listen to your podcast, I think the, the, the best thing about it, really, is that you reach an audience that maybe wouldn't have gone to an academic conference or an audience that, um, uh, that wouldn't have fitted into a room. Like, let me just have a quick check. Um, so we've got six people in this meeting now. Um, and it's being recorded, right? So add a couple more people that would have listened to it later on. So the same with a podcast is you actually extend your reach and and the, and, the, and who actually listens or can learn from your research. Um, Bill, uh, perhaps, I'm jump in. Yeah. Um, nobody's asked a question, but I'm going to jump in and ask a question myself to encourage others to also um, jump in and ask questions, though you'll be doing it by the chat box um, and I'll then pass them on. But do you know who's listening to your podcast? I mean, it seems to me that that must be one of the difficult things, because if you run a podcast, you obviously want to play to your audience a bit and give. But I'm, I'm curious, 
how do you know who is listening to your podcast and and do you know who's listening to your podcast actually so that's a difficult uh, difficult uh, it's, a, it's a great question difficult answer because um what's what's hard is is you you can see the amount of views or listens as they call it but th often that's not very reliable data so all the data that all of the podcasters will be presenting today as proud as we are it's it, it's it could be murky in terms of um, have they listened to the entire episode was it just one click now there are ways of a kind of i know apple is improving that but it's sometimes difficult to see the quantity of of, of people listening and also in terms of privacy you, you don't get the data of who's uh, listening but there are some ways in which you can kind of figure it out right so very often on so i have a website called www.amsterdamspodcast.nl and we can actually see where people uh, log in from right so uh, there's a lot of people my because my podcast in dutch they're all dutch listeners generally uh, some from Belgium as well. Um, uh, when I post something about um, that's very relevant for public policy uh, makers, I all of a sudden get a lot of uh, views from The Hague, right? So it, I'm guessing, but I would assume that's somewhere around the ministries, perhaps. Uh, what's better data is the mailing list that I have on my website. Uh, and that actually shows me, obviously, the email addresses and that those people get notifications of when a new podcast has been launched. So in that regard, I do know, kind of know. Now, my target audience was uh, lawyers in general, but also public purchasers that have to work with the law, uh, policymakers, judges, lawyers. And I find that in terms of who shares the content, who on social media, say LinkedIn and Twitter, and also who uh, creates, um, uh, who responds to it via columns or blogs, uh, it's very varied. So um, in, in that sense, the, the audience that I wanted to reach, I, I think I'm reaching. Also, from the feedback that I get at conferences or at other uh, meetups, uh, but that's it's very difficult to actually know who's listening to your podcast. But perhaps um, Vincent can share some thoughts, or um, Bob and Gazala can can do that later on as well. Um, uh, but again, like Catherine said, please share your your questions as well in the in the box. Um, just to finish off, uh, the the image of, of public procurement was one of my more, I would you say, ambitious. Um, um, personal motivations, because I find discussions in general are very unbalanced when we hear about public procurement, say the FIRA in the Netherlands or all major infrastructural projects. Um, uh, so what's, uh, what I'd like to do is to actually show people that you can have balanced discussions, right, between people to point, pinpoint the, high, the, the negatives and the positive sides of, uh, of podcasting. Um, I just saw a message from, from Charlotte. Um, uh, you can indeed have access to the recording and we'll share that on the website of Utrecht University uh, following the, the lecture. But thank you for, uh, for asking. So a short recap um, about my podcast with some experiences in there. It's, I've 13 episodes so far, which is still, I think, also at its infancy rate. Right. So I still feel like I'm learning a lot. And uh, if I listen to the first episode, that feels hor horrible, right? Um, particularly listening to your own voice is something that you'll have to get used to. Um, but that also quickly, or at least that initial hunch also quickly fades. Um, so based on the murky data that I have, I do see an incline of, so in the beginning it was only 20 people per episode. And now that's really drastically has grown to say 350 to uh, 250 to 350. Now the, the recent episode that I did on, um, on COVID-19 and public procurement, you can imagine that is now fourfold or something because it kind of touched upon the possibilities in the law and how people should be dealing with it. So that was very topical. Um, uh, what was a, an interesting spin-off I thought was that I'm using, even though the podcast is based on research, it's, it's a great way to uh, use it in student and executive uh, education. So for uh, executive courses for professionals, um, and I find that particularly uh, that aspect is something that I didn't expect myself. I just use it as prescribed reading or as um, additional reading. Um, so what I'm learning there is that very a lot of students prefer to listen to a podcast first. They get to get the the hot topics, the the, the discussion points, and then they move on to uh, to uh, the more uh, nitty gritty type of jurisprudence or actual the actual research itself. But at least that gives them some context to whilst they start reading with a certain lens. And now the same for professionals. 
um, uh, I've, I've had the same experience. They they also like it as an alternative to to more lengthy, particularly practitioners that have been working for, in the field for a long time. They prefer just decent edible chunks of of of, of materials, and this, a podcast is a nice uh, appetizer or a nice starter to it. Um, another thing that I thought was was interesting is that. Uh, the Juridische Leidraad for, for Dutch speakers, or I'm not sure about the English versions, but is you can actually refer to podcasts as well in uh, as a recording. So then it's kind of in between an, a website result and an audio recording and an interview, those three three aspects. Um, and um, I, that can perhaps also be an incentive to, to, to go into podcasting because uh, very often I find that the recognition for, for certain additional activities that we do as academics aren't valued as much as, say, a double-blind, peer-reviewed article, right? So this can kind of compensate uh, there. Um, and the responses that I've had in grant applications has been quite good. It's really, then it's very much put under the section of uh, societal impact or societal value of your of your work. Um, so in, in a way, you can use it in that, uh, in that aspect as well. Um, what I'm thinking of is uh, English episodes. So I've started this project with uh, Marta Onthoff, um, and we're we're going to be working with some English podcast. She works at the University of Copenhagen, so it's the same concept of Bistec, but then in the English version. Um, and uh, uh, Dave Fontor works at Criminal Law at Utrecht University, and I have recently been granted some USO money with internally to, to explore the potential of podcasting in legal education. So we'll be looking at podcasts as, as testing tools for, for students. So instead of a proper exam or um, a paper, you have to make a podcast or that you use a podcast as an analytical tool. Um, so you listen to one and you need to gain, you need to get a subject from that type of, um, uh, from a podcast. So, so that's what's, the, that's what's coming. Um, but more practically, and I think this could perhaps be useful for, for people that are thinking of starting a, a podcast, is how do you do it, right? Practically speaking, you want, you've want you decided that you want to start a podcast. Okay, what what's the next step? So basically, just to run it down, what I do is I, discuss, I invite a guest, obviously, of research that I think is interesting. So they have to be authors, um, even though I'm also thinking of now doing a practitioner series, right, to also discuss uh, their, their practical best practices. But I discuss the structure with them. So what's the topic? What are relevant discussion points? Uh, sometimes via hypotheses, sometimes via actual questions. Uh, but I find that the more structured uh, the, 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 inter the, well, the discussion is, so whether it's an interview or, or a discussion, uh, it does improve the, the, the episode. So it doesn't need to be, you don't need a script, but I find that structure is everything in terms of for, for listeners' pleasure. If they don't, if listeners don't know where the conversation is going, um, very often they, they lose track and they log out. Um, so I've always done face-to-face -face recordings. Um, you can see half of my set set up on the picture. Um, it's just two microphones, a splitter and then a computer. Um, and basically, uh, recently I started recording them via Zoom, uh, but you could use any type of recording tool, really. Um, the advantage of Zoom, obviously, or any type of online tool is that you can also, there's no travel time involved. And for me, it means that I can easily do it with people in affected areas, in lockdown, etc. So that's quite uh, timely. In that sense. Willem, can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. um, oh, look, a question's come through. And actually, it's exactly one that I was going to ask too. So this is a question from, um, um, I can't see the full name, Hook Mavender is from uh, Leiden. Do you have a standard structure or does it um, vary considerably between episodes? And I was going to ask something similar, so maybe I'll add my question onto that, which is that you talk about having guests. To what extent do you see podcasts, you know, your guests, as being the source of the information in the podcast. We talked about this once before about to what extent do you think podcasts should have an asymmetry to them with an interviewer and an interviewee, one person trying to elicit information from another? Or can can you have a or would it be okay just to have a chat where you're both equally participating? I, yeah, both are very relevant, relevant questions. To so start off with this with the standard structure. Uh, so most podcasts do have a standard structure in terms of 
very often it starts with a short, short welcome, short intro, a jingle, which is general, usually pre-record. It's always pre-recorded with a little bit of a tune, right? This is this podcast. This is what it is. This is this series, perhaps. And then the full conversation starts. Now, you have podcasts where people just are just by themselves, right? So that's also an option. Um, and they just talk into a, to a microphone. I find those a little bit less engaging, particularly if you're listening for 40 minutes to listen to just one voice. It's almost like more of an audio book. Um, I, so to end that structure, I also have an outro. So that's also a standard thing that always uh, happens in which I ask people to, if they're interested, uh, to, to continue the conversation and to, to keep discussing the, um, uh, the content of the episode. I have one opening question that's always a little bit more, I wouldn't say personal, but off topic about their career or whatever. So one thing I find is it helps them kind of ease into the conversation. And it's interesting as a listener to kind of get something of a story behind the author. Um, there's a standard ending question that I have. If you could change three things in the law or in practice, what would you do? And in between that, the structure always changes depending on the topic. So, uh, so there's, I suppose, a standard audio edit structure with opening jingle conversation outro. Um, and then you would have the, um, the, the, those standard two questions that I ask everyone, but in between it's the same. Um, and then to move on to your question, uh, Catherine, what I find, uh, uh, I find in the beginning when I started, uh, and I can be very open about this, I was very much an interviewer because I was also nervous. And I was, uh, I think, anxious about, is the recording going well? Is this going to be good enough to record, et cetera? So uh, I, automatically, because of that, you kind of go into this asymmetrical style of the guest is the expert and the, um, uh, and the, the, the interviewer is just, is just talking every now and then. Now, it would be interesting to also hear some reflections of about law podcasts because they, 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 they talk about, uh, they talk to different experts. So we'll get onto that, I think, a bit late, later on. But I think what I find the most interesting to listen to is when, the, um, when two people are more on equal footing. Because that's, and that's also something that I'm trying to achieve with my podcast is to actually uh, reach a discussion that I would normally have with someone at an academic conference. Or a discuss but then perhaps at the conference drinks, right? So a little bit more open and a little bit more lighthearted than uh, than at a very in a very formal setting. Um, does that answer your question? Also, just uh, looking at Van der Hoekma, if if he's uh, he's satisfied, and if ah, do you rehearse anything? Um, so we have a pre-chat. So when I say discuss structure, that's usually via email, but we pre-chat as well to say, okay, what do you really think about this? Um, and that's kind of, uh, one, I think it helps the structure of the, of the podcast the content, it makes it more interesting, but also it, it helps to, um, uh, um, to make the guests a little bit more comfortable because that's something that you have to take into account. Some people might just be nervous, right? That's, I think, a very natural thing, particularly if you don't do it very often. Um, so, and in terms of time, I think that's the advantage of being the podcast host. Once you start rounding off or you can give little hints and you can go, okay, this is the structure. This is what we wanted to discuss. Sometimes I have to skip things and just go, okay, we've reached, <clears throat> we're nearly at the end. This is why one of these closing questions works very well, at least for me, is to say, look, we're about to close off, but I really wanted to discuss one final thing with you. And then they have the floor for that. So it's kind of, you, you'll create a bit of a gut feeling in a while, over time, I think, uh, which you can kind of feel, okay, this is, uh, now we've reached, we've gone full circle in the conversation. What is also always an option is if you feel like you haven't discussed everything, you just close off the conversation and say at the end, look, we'll be discussing more about this and this in the next episode, right? Because you have always, you have space for, for that. Um, so after the recording, just to get back to the to the structure, after the recording, I do a small edit in Audacity. Now there's multiple uh, editing tools that you can use. Uh, Rene will discuss a bit more about that later on. Um, and you, um, I have a company that kind of makes my sound a bit better, right? It just uh, it uh, he adds the jingle in for me. It costs 50 euros an an episode, I believe, um, and he kind of proofs the sound. Um, in the beginning, I did everything myself, and I found that takes that takes way too much time. 
Um, maybe because I'm not tech savvy enough, even though I think I'm a bit above average when it comes to that. But it's uh, it, I listened to so many YouTube videos in the beginning. So yes, you can just get started, and go for it straight away. But to have a bit of funds to uh, to 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 have to whilst you're starting, that's actually quite quite useful. Um, then I uploaded on SoundCloud, and then SoundCloud instantly links uh, with uh, other apps, and they're visible in iTunes, all of those type of things. Um, and then there's a bit of marketing involved, or if you call it that. Um, small introduction in a blog post on my website, uh, LinkedIn post via the Bistec LinkedIn account, Twitter. And I find that's also where discussions start. So when people see the announcement there, that's when they start commenting and discussing the contents of the episode. Um, now, some final thoughts before I pass the baton on. Um, I've got a question coming in. Did you train your voice? Did you get any tips speaking slowly? Not every voice is nice to listen to. I don't know if that's a suggestion uh, or if that's a question. I hope it's a question. Um, no, I didn't train my voice other than having to get used to listening to your own voice. I find that um, in the beginning, I spoke a lot quicker than I do now in audio recordings because I suppose that just happens when you're a bit nervous and when you're starting out. Um, but I wouldn't worry too much about it, but I you know that sounds like terrible advice, but, um, you probably, uh, I, I don't know what voice trainers can do, but, um, you'll just probably just have to work with what you have. And, uh, if, if you enjoy it yourself, you can actually hear that in the recording. So there's certain episodes where I'm totally in it, into it and you can hear that I'm enthused. And that also, I see that reflected in the views, even though I don't know if there's a causal relationship between the two, but perhaps there is. Um, uh, SoundCloud as a podcast, as a host, um, uh, there was no thought behind it. So perhaps there's better ones out there. So I know there's um, uh, there's hosting companies that actually do the linking for you. So if you do SoundCloud and you want it to be uploaded to other platforms as well, you need to link the RSS RSS feed yourself. But I know, and I think about Law will share that as well, and perhaps Vincent, that there are companies that do this whole aspect for you. Um, uh, so that's and thank you. Uh, good to hear that that I have a nice nice voice, both voices. Um, uh, all right. So I see Aaron is sharing uh, that he's using Podbean. Well, exactly. There's there's different ways of of going uh, going about it. Um, and Brian, thank you for sharing your thoughts on voice trainers. So perhaps that is something uh, worth uh, worth your uh, worth your while. Um, just to close off my section, because I don't want to uh, violate my own rules of time, because I was supposed to keep track of, of time in this uh, this webinar, but we're still we're still on time, I think. I would just say, if you're interested, just go for it. Uh, I believe Vincent once told me that um, uh, the first 20 episodes are, ter are, are terrible. Well, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if actually if it's, that's how he phrased it, but um, it's it's a learning process. So. If you're unsure, have someone else listen to it, but I would just get started because you, you they get better as you go along. Um, and, if you're, and if you're an academic, content will always be good, but the, the shape and form can always, uh, can always change, I think. Um, now, this is something that we discussed already. Think about your setup and your audience. Um, I think that can be useful prior to it. So perhaps just discuss it with some people from your marketing department at your university and also uh, to think about where the actual gap lies. So I found that there were a lot of practitioners and public purchasers and even lawyers that struggled to keep up with research. Uh, so that defined my, my audience and I went with that. Um, two final things. Uh, don't be stingy when you purchase a microphone, even though that's not necessary, right? So if you just want to get started, one of these things, they work quite well, as long as you keep them close to your, close to your mouth. Um, but particularly when you have multiple voices and it needs to, there needs to be audio editing, it is actually quite useful to have two different, uh, two different microphones if you're doing it face-to-face. -face. Um, or if at least your, your sound quality is, is good. If you can get some help with, with audio quality, that's great. If you have the funds for that, um, I think it's useful. Um, in hindsight, I don't think I should have invested as much time as I did in the end in these first, uh, first episodes. Um, even though I loved exploring it, so but those were Sundays after Sunday afternoons that I'm not going to get back. But I think it was worth it in the end, I suppose. Um, and then to to close off my bit um, I, for for Dutch speakers, I wrote a blog about this uh, these experiences that I had in the first uh, first six months, which I think 
practically basically says about the same as I've told you already, but perhaps you can uh, you can get some more insights uh, insights from that. Um, if there are no more questions for me, let's move on to the to the next uh, podcast uh, host. It's actually great to have them on, uh, on in this webinar today because I met them um, uh, when they interviewed me about my research. Um, and uh, so far, I think they've maybe even interviewed three or four people from Utrecht University, but uh, I'll, I'll let them uh, share their experiences uh, from now on. Yes, shall I? Can I start? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having Bob and I on uh, your webinar. Thank you, Willem and Catherine, for the invitation. And thank you for the attendees um, for joining. Um, what are we going to talk about? I'm going to scroll to. Can I go to? Oh, can I? Oh, right, this one. Wait, one moment. Yes. Right. Um, what am I going to? What we are going to talk about? We're going to do a joint presentations first. I'll tell you something about us and. Uh, how we create content and a little bit about the production process. Uh, Bob will tell you about that and uh, our marketing, uh, the milestones and some lessons learned. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll repeat what Willem said, put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them uh, as uh, well as we can. Uh, when we go to the next page. Yes. So my name is Ghazali Dabiran. I'm the producer of About Law. Um, uh, we both have a legal background. My legal background is I, I've been a lawyer, um, uh, advocate as the Dutch call it, a corporate lawyer. Then I moved on to publishing, legal publishing at Kluwer and uh, legal conferencing at one point. And now um, I produce this podcast together with Bob. No. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Uh, this is uh, this is Bob. Would you yeah. like to introduce yeah, sure. yourself? Hi. So my name is Bob. I'm the show host. So I'm the one actually here on the podcast interviewing people. I'm an independent lawyer. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a freelance lawyer and get hired by companies to work for them. And I'm working predominantly on IT contracts and privacy. Um, and there's actually some quite some really good podcasts on those topics available. Um, but so, yeah, so I'm the show host. Back right. to Kazani. Yes. Um, so what is About Law and why we started? Um, About Law is a bi-weekly legal podcast. Uh, we launched uh, in January 2019, so a little bit uh, longer than a year now. Um, it's about news and developments from a legal perspective. We, we say, you know, it's made by lawyers for lawyers. Um, when we started at the time, there was actually almost no legal podcast in the Netherlands or nothing we could find. I think uh, Willem and us, we started in the same month even, didn't we, Willem? Um, so um, we, we, love, we love listening to other podcasts. So we were thinking, you know, where are the Dutch legal podcasts? And there weren't any. So we thought, okay, let's just start one ourselves. And just like Willem, we're both quite techy as well. So we thought that we could do it. If we, others can do it, we can. Um, and we also realize it's kind of hard to stay up to date with a lot of different uh, developments, legal developments. And this is a nice way to, 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 to listen to those developments during lost moments. As Catherine said, you know, doing the washing and the driving and, the, you know, the, the dead moments where you have nothing else to do. So uh, why not listen to podcasts? And I also listen to, to crime podcasts. <laughs> But this is uh, this is also uh, this is also a way to keep up with your legal uh, education, and for many lawyers and scientists, and um, it's the perfect way to talk about something they're passionate about. So, I think anyone we at the beginning we were kind of afraid of um, approaching people who would want to be on our podcast, and whoever we approach always says yes. So. Um, um, that is really nice because they do want, especially people who are doing research, they want to bring it to the public and they want to talk about what they're what they're doing. So that's really nice. Um, the content itself. So the um, you, your podcast, Willem, is, is, a, is, is based on one field and we uh, decided to do um, uh, uh, the subjects are very diverse, so we do uh, whatever we actually feel like doing, <laughs> what we like ourselves. So um, we read a lot, we see things, you know, on LinkedIn, and we just think, hey, this is interesting. If, if I would like to listen to it, we, we would produce it. So um, the target audience is commercial Dutch lawyers. Um, 
Uh, so we haven't done any, you know, criminal law yet or family law, but we might. We never know if it's interesting enough. We will. Um, and going back to one of your questions, if it's scripted, I would say we are. Um, we uh, do a lot of research ourselves first. We read about it and then we uh, make questions and then send them to the to the guests, talk to them about it if they're OK with the questions and then um, and then plan the recording. So I would call it it's quite scripted, but we try to make it sound as a nice chat. <laughs> Uh, but it is, uh, they know what they're going to be asked, basically. And the language is Dutch. Um, we might also expand to English. We haven't got any concrete plans yet, but at the moment it's Dutch. And on your screen, you'll see the last six episodes. It's in Dutch, sorry, but it's, um, you can see the diverse uh, fields that we handle. Um, we also try to do some podcasts about legal in the legal field, not particularly about a certain subject, but for example, trends in in the law in the field of law or something, or legal tech or legal design or something like that. Something relevant, but not very, um, you know, very academic. So let's say. Um, and this is uh, our guests are usually uh, senior lawyers from well-known, mainly well-known uh, law firms. Uh, academics, legal lecturers, professors, experts in their fields. Can you spot Willem there? <laughs> this is a selection of our guests. Um, and uh, yeah, th th without them, uh, we wouldn't be able to make this. And uh, we're very grateful to them, of course. Um, I'm going to give the, the screen to Bob. He's going to tell you something about the recording process. OK, so after we send out the questions to the uh, to the guest, we set up a Skype call with them, and that's how we record the podcast. So we don't use Zoom, we use Skype, but we could have chosen Zoom too, I guess. Um, Skype needs some additional software installed on top of that so that you can actually record in different tracks so that you can edit them later on separately. Um, there's not a lot of gear that you need. You need a computer, you need a headphone, and, and like Willem said, don't be stingy, buy a really good microphone because that will really uh, drive the audio audio quality uh, in the end. So if you don't have a good microphone, you're going to be sounding less good. So uh, so so just spend that money. It it, it cost mine cost 150 euro, which is you know more than sufficient. Uh, uh, Bob, just a just a, a quick question from my yep. side, or perhaps that you could clarify that because the yep. technical side to me was totally new, and you're already sp speaking like an expert. Can you just explain briefly what this tr this tracks means and like yes. uh, if uh, what it relates to? Yeah. So um, what is important to have if you record people is that you create audio files of each person that you that is talking on the podcast separately so that you can also edit them, edit them separately. So you don't want one file with all the voices in them, because if I sound, if my volume is too low and my guest is too high, then you can't, it's really difficult to, to, to balance that out, so to speak. So um, uh, it's important then to, track, to, to split those tracks and have separate tracks of each of the, um, of the speakers on the podcast. So, we chose for um, uh, doing um, using Skype uh, mainly because I, I don't have the time to to visit people and, and go to their office and, and the lawyers that we interview usually don't have time to come into the studio. So then doing the as, at a distance is, is, is the best way to do it. Uh, we chose Skype because everybody's used to Skype. So a lot of the people that we interview are not really tech savvy and, and we didn't want them to do difficult stuff on the computers before we start recording because that may be stress inducing for our guests uh, and everybody knows Skype so that's quite easy to do. Uh, the downside to using Skype is that the sound quality can sometimes be a bit glitchy uh, and that takes a lot of editing later on to edit all those glitches out or redoing questions with the speakers etc. So it isn't perfect but it's it's the best setup for us to be honest so far. Uh, but we'll, we'll we'll maybe use Zoom sometime and then see how that works and if it's less glitchy. But um, for, until now, we've been happy with uh, using Skype. Um, so after I've I've uh, recorded the um, the podcast in Skype, I have separate files for each of the speakers, you know, the tracks, 
and then we edit the the, uh, the podcast in a program that's already pre-installed on my Mac, which is called GarageBand. Now, there's lots of other alternatives there that you can use, but this was just readily available on my computer, and, and it's, it's quite simple to use. Um, it's free, so that's helpful, and it's uh, there's lots of YouTube tutorials. So if you're not sure what to do or how to do something, then it's quite easy to use something that's used a lot because you can just go on YouTube and then ask a question, you know, Google a question on how to do something, and then it's quite easy to learn. The editing for me takes quite a lot of work. So uh, I, for every episode, it takes me about two hours to just cut and paste all the static out. And, 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 and you know, I do a lot of ums in my questions and I cut those out to the questions as well. And then sometimes I redo questions with speakers and then I have to cut out the old question and all that stuff takes time. So about two hours per episode. I think that's cool. important to know. Can I yes. cut in there? And um, yep. I think it's a it's helpful to ask the question to you that's in the chat box because it's relevant yeah. to understanding yes, what that yes, two yes, hours yes. means. Um, how long are the episodes? Oh, an episode is about between 30 and 45 minutes. Okay, so that was a question from Birgit. Okay, and, and the format is really an interview style, so it's I'll more, yeah, them, yeah. yeah, it's uh, asymmetric really. So because we have so many different topics that we discuss, I'm not an expert in all those topics, so it's it makes more sense for me to have an interview style. Uh, and the good thing about having an interviewer is that people don't have to listen to one person all the time. Uh, but you know, you break up the the, the 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 conversation a bit by having an interviewer there. Uh, and also, it 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 works quite well because I have the same expertise level as the listeners. So I can just, you know, if if the if the guest is too detailed, I can bring him down or start you know asking questions to to you know to explain stuff more uh, so that really works well for our because we have a podcast with a diverse number of topics that works really well great thank you so just, just, sorry bob just yeah. just to add to that leo uh, from, from brugge just posted i heard that zoom is having some privacy issues I'm not sure what that means for choosing zoom over skype um I don't know if that's a consideration for you guys. For me, it is actually. So yeah. I'm considering looking at other options at the moment. Well, it's for me, it's I don't use Zoom for that reason, but I wouldn't mind using it for recording podcasts because it's it'll be posted online anyway. So uh, it's it, it's not a private conversation. People, you know, the people on the call know that everything they'll say will be published anyway. But um, yes, there's there's privacy concerns. Definitely. Yeah. Right. So. Just like William said, I, I use I spent a lot of hours in the beginning on on getting the audio right. I was quite insecure about it, and and I thought there was you know, much progress to be made there. Uh, so we actually hire a third party called Right Royal Audio. They're in the UK, uh, and they do the mixing and and mastering for us. So basically, they make make me sound good on on the podcast, and uh, that's also if you listen to the podcast, that's why my voice sounds different here than in the podcast. <laughs> Uh, I, I pay about we pay about 13 to 26 euro per episode to do that, uh, depending on the length of the episode and the turnaround time is about three days. Uh, I can highly recommend Right Royal Audio. They're they're really brilliant and they they do a really good job on 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 getting the audio levels right. So is that in addition to the two hours you said you spent, or is yes. that yes. Right. Yes. So uh, what the difference is, I, I'm, you know, I, I put the sequence, I, I make the sequence of all the questions, and then cut out all the, all the the questions that I don't think are that relevant, and uh, I put the music in, in you know, I, I edit the music in, etc. And then Right Royal Audio makes sure that I sound good. They they work on the sound quality. And to add to that, I think that's also the difference between uh, the editing that we do, right? So. So you 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 do a lot yourself. I cut that out. So basically, also putting in the jingle and getting out the ums and the silences and stuff. That's also done by by the the audio people that I've mm -hmm. hired. So there's different degrees of how much help you can get. That's what, yeah. what I wanted to to add. And um, also our our um, our guy uh, Sam. He's called Sam. He's um, he's he's English speaking, and our podcast is in Dutch, so he can't actually understand anything. Yeah, that would be difficult. <laughs> So he actually he only listens to you know the sound or he takes out you know takes out the the bad stuff so he yeah. doesn't understand you know if they're you know. But if it would be an English podcast, then probably he would he would do that too. You know, cut out yeah. all the ums and the all the other stuff. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's... Just to add to that, there's a question from uh, Gert and Tom who asks, uh, "How about the rights? So what about the rights of the use of mu music?" 
Oh, ah. I, I have a really great friend that's a musician and I've asked him to produce music for me. So, I, you know, but what is a really great tip is that Google has free sound clips available uh, that you can just Google. And there's about 100 to 200, you know, short music clips that they published specifically for this reason, for including in videos and, and, and audio files, etc. You can just use them right free. So it's uh, it's easy to do. You would only have to start paying royalties once you include like proper uh, commercial music in, in your podcast. All right. Yeah. All right. Oh yeah. And then my last bit is the, the hosting. Uh, so we don't publish to SoundCloud. What we do is we have a company, it's called Blueberry. Uh, and they host the podcast. So once we've recorded it and all the all the audio levels are okay, we just have one file and we upload that to Blueberry and then uh, we get an XML back or a link back and, and send that to, um, to all the podcast uh, uh, apps that are out there. And then from there on, every time we publish a file, then it gets automatically pushed to all the podcast apps. We pay about 12 US dollars a month for 100 MB uh, per month that you can upload. And the reason we chose Blueberry is because they have a WordPress integration. So it's really easy to, um, uh, to also include your podcast on the website. So apart from having the, our podcast available through Blueberry on all the different podcast apps, you know, it's really easy to have your audio file available on your web, WordPress website as well. So I think that's, uh, that was for us to define or the, um, the crucial point in choosing for Blueberry. Yeah, this is a screenshot of our website, and then you can see that there's a audio player on there. That's how it looks. This is uh, episode 35. Can I um, just ask a quick question when you say sure. you've got an integrated audio player? Mm -hmm. um, where do you find people listen? Is it, or is there any way that you could, you could see where the views are coming from? Is it more from these specific podcast apps, or is it via your website, or uh, yeah. can you track that data? Yeah, so Blueberry, the, the company that hosted, has a statistics page. And on the statistics page, you can also see uh, where people are listening from, so the countries, but you can also see the platforms where they listen. So m m around 80% of our listeners actually use podcast apps. In the beginning, it was a lot of people listening to, on a website, to be honest. So they needed to be edu educated a bit on how to listen to podcasts. So for the first, you know, in, in episodes 10 to 20, I included some instructions on, hey, if, are you listening to this on a website? There are better ways to listen to it. And we have a section on our website uh, that says, who on the right top, uh, right, uh, top of the website so that, you know, people start to learn how to listen to podcasts. But nowadays, it's about 80% listens to, to uh, in, in Apple Podcasts or Android Podcast apps. Yeah. And Spotify. And Spotify as well. That's really helpful. And we just started uploading our website or our podcast also to YouTube. So it's just static image, but then some sound. So uh, maybe the, we haven't seen any results from that back, but uh, we're curious whether will people will actually use that or find our podcast through YouTube. Um, there's one more question from... Uh... Uh, in the chat um, from A. Lighten, who's asking about um, the extent to which this integration works with all web websites. Um, they've got a page with Wix. Do, do, you, do you happen to know if that, that's compatible? Um, well, the, 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 it's probably compatible. I haven't tried it. There is a link within Blueberry to, that you can just include in your uh, in the back end of your website or your Wix website, and then it's just like any other audio file that's hosted elsewhere. You can just link to it. Um, but I haven't any had any any experience with Wix, so I can't say for sure. And, and another question, because I noticed that perhaps it's also to Willem. Both of you have a website. Is it necessary to have a website if you have a podcast? Do you need an accompanying website? You don't really Not need really, it. No. no, you don't need it, but it's it's it is helpful to have that because a lot of the lawyers and the people that listen to us haven't haven't listened to podcasts before. So it's it's good to have, have a landing platform for them uh, to find us and to find us online. And from there on, once they've learned how to podcast and listen to podcasts, they'll start learning listening to the podcast in the app. But uh, but it's not necessary to have a website. No, not at all. No. Yeah, and I try to personally not direct them to the website because we want them to use podcast apps, 
because when you use an app, uh, you will, if you're uh, subscribing to our uh, our podcast, you get an automatic notification when we upload a new uh, episode. And you don't get that if you, you know, if it's on your websites, of course. So they have to, you know, go there themselves every every week and check if there's a new web. Whereas if you have the app, you get a notification. And so I'm actually, you know, I don't actually advertise our our page at all anywhere. I want them all to go to the either on Spotify or on um, on their podcast app, so they get the notification. <laughs> right? Can I move on? Any more questions? Okay. Right. Uh, a little bit about the marketing, um, same as Willem said, um, uh, what I do is um, actually before we publish an episode, I um, I do a little teaser the week before. So we publish every Tuesday, every two weeks. So on a Thursday before that Tuesday, I, I, I do a little, uh, you know, coming next week, this and that. And then after we publish, um, I make uh, these kind of, you know, images to announce it saying you know new new episode now available and then the name and a picture and uh, something like this and then uh, this i spread around and on linkedin twitter and uh, we also ask our our guests to use their network to spread the word so they actually you know uh, the, share our posts also in their network and they all have all these lawyers in their network so we every time we reach new people that way Sometimes uh, we do giveaways if they've written a book, for example, and they want more, more, you know, more, um, uh, yeah, publicity for the book. So we do a giveaway and their publishers are always very willing to give us a book to give away. And uh, we always ask, you know, if you want to help us like or comment our posts or share them, stuff like that. Um, and this, these kind of images, you can just, you know, use free software on the internet. There's no, you know, you don't need Photoshop or any extensive uh, training for that. I just make these myself. Um, about just, our, uh, my, sorry, to, yes. Sorry to briefly interrupt. Um, yes. Leo van Brugge asks, uh, I think rightfully so, um, how many hours a week do you spend working on your podcast? I think between us, um... every every I've had that in a later slide. Every every um, podcast between us takes about twelve to sixteen hours to make. I guess so. That's from researching people, finding people to 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 talk, coming up with the questions, recording, mixing, and then all the marketing. It's about twelve hours, I would say. Yeah. At least. All right. Good to know. I think I owed an apology to to Leonie for calling her Leo three times already. So, <laughs> um, but that was shortened in my my app. But apologies, she was asking some great questions. But keep keep going. All right. Um, so uh, some uh, Willem asked us to also share some of our milestones. Well, actually, the the first two are from our from this year, January in January two thousand twenty. We were approached by Advocacy.nl. That's a Dutch uh, platform for lawyers. Um, if they if they didn't have a podcast, they were thinking of starting their own podcast, and then they saw our podcast and thought, you know, would you like to be our, you know, on our website, on our platform as a podcast? And we said yes, of course. And uh, so that's uh, we were quite happy with that. And um, also in January, um, uh, we had our first sponsor called Cleos from Walters Kluwer who. Uh, they had this a company that has software for uh, file management for lawyers. So they, this is their target group, actually, their target customers. And they approached us, and they, you know, they uh, they uh, with their with their sponsorship, we can uh, cover some of our costs, uh, you know, from for the audio for for Sam and uh, Royal Right Audio and stuff like that. Some of the hosting, so that's really nice. And uh, yeah, the 500 downloads we thought was nice to see on on Blueberry because you know we uh, we reached that uh, about a week ago or two weeks ago two something weeks two ago, weeks yeah. ago we reached that so that's a nice uh, milestone as well we thought. Uh, and then yeah. the lessons learned I'll give it back to Bob. Yeah, so there's a, a, you know Willem asked us to to share some lessons learned with you. I think the first one is hang in there, right? It takes time before you follow an audience, and 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 or whether you or, or it takes time to, to to gather an audience and to to get people to listen to your podcast. The first podcast didn't do too well. There were ten or twenty listeners, 
but now every episode now is 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 reaching between four and five hundred, and and a couple have now already gone above five hundred downloads per episode. So there's an increase really in in the number of people that listen to our podcast. So that's really good. I think the second takeaway is uh, you need a regular publication schedule. If you listen to all the the, the experts in content marketing, publish something with a regular schedule so that people can fit it in their regular um, regular schedule reg- regular schedule so you know it doesn't matter if once a month or every week or whatever uh, but it needs to have some regularity to it um the other thing is that podcasting is really easy and everybody feels like an imposter for the first 10 episodes or so and then after that it comes more naturally uh, but it's quite easy to do um uh, but it takes time so for us it takes about 12 hours at minimum for every episode to to do um Use LinkedIn and marketing and use LinkedIn and Twitter a lot for marketing. I think that's really important and helped us because we speak to another guest every episode. Or um, And then if we use their LinkedIn connections, that really drives our marketing and drives the, the audience numbers for us. Um, and then the last thing is that we think it's important to just make it look professional too, not just sound professional, but makes it look professional. So, you know, have a nice logo, you know, develop a house style, et cetera, because that will, will really um, improve the way that people view you and see you and, and, and whether they think you're professional or not. So I think that's important as well. And then maybe the last point before we do questions, if there are any Uh, If there's any interesting topics you know about that would be interesting for our podcast, then also let us know, right? If you you have good speakers or good guests that you would want to hear on our podcast, then by all means, send us a message and then we'll look into it. Any questions? I think we've covered a few already, but if there are any more, then um, I'm happy to answer them. No. All right, feel free to... um, um... Oh, great. A request has been submitted to to create a podcast on the Omgevingswet, the Environmental Planning uh, Act, I think it's called. Okay, um, good. And, and Interesting. one final final question as well. How do you, uh, do you know your guests beforehand? If not, how do you approach them? The, the first episodes we did a lot on our own network. So we had, you know, law professors that we knew or, or some lawyers from law firms. But nowadays people start to tend to to write us and ask us if they can be in our podcast so about half the people just approach us and ask hey great podcast can we be on it and can you interview me maybe um and and the the other stuff we just google you know if you have a really interesting topic you know then we just google and and see who we can find sometimes we ask people uh, that we know already um so it's you know different it's a mix of everything yeah. everything yeah yeah Another, que- another question um, that, that somebody's asked is that whether you would recommend, um, I guess, recording a few before publishing your first one. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if, if you did that or whether you would recommend people to do that. No, we, we just recorded the first one and then published it. And uh, so, you know, it's up it's up to, to whoever wants to make a podcast, whether they want to do it or not. But uh, uh, for us, the first one was, was OK and we just uh, went with it and, and published it, you know. So just dive right in. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, just the one comment that I saw pop by and a question coming in. Um, uh, just in response to Tessa Dipor, and she's asking uh, if the PowerPoints can be made available. So uh, that's definitely possible. Um, and, be- and But we'll also share the recording. So um, I think she has some childcare duties, which is totally understandable. So she can continue listening at a certain point. Um, I saw a question coming in from, I think, Ingrid Leiter from, uh, from Leiden University. Um, uh, oh, did you already answered that? Um, and there was one more? No, that was it. All right. Okay. I think those are the, um, got lost in the chat box just then. It's never a nice place to get lost. <laughs> um, I will, um, thank you so much for your, for your comments, but also please, please hang in there because perhaps there's some questions that will pop up and it's nice to reflect on the different styles, right? Because you can already notice the difference between, between my podcast and, um, uh, and your podcast. Uh, you're doing different fields of law, mine just one, bi-weekly, um, uh, monthly. So I think that's interesting to also to showcase that there's different ways of doing this, right? And there's not one, one way of doing a good, good podcast. But thanks so much.
Um, I will, um, we're moving on to, to Vincent Corona, also of Utrecht University. I briefly introduced him already, but he has a, he's, been having, he's been podcasting for a few years now. Um, uh, and with his podcast, On the Media, uh, Professor, and perhaps he can also explain to us if that's a, a reference to On the Professor by, uh, by Hermans. It is, it is. And it's On the Media Doctoren, because oh, we're not professors yet. Um, well, we started off in November 2012, so I think we're the ancient uh, podcast here, among the others. Um, in, in 2012, we didn't have quite a, a good idea about what a podcast is. So in the first few years, we, we were trying to find out what it is to make a podcast and why it's not a radio show or a television show or any other genre. And well, one of the questions that was asked is why would you sh why would you make a podcast for us? It was quite obvious that we were media scholars, uh, three of us, media and communication, and we were talking a lot about media and communication. We were doing research on media and communication. So we find it, uh, found it really important to also make media and, and learning by doing and, and being better scholars in actually making media and better understand our own field. And uh, maybe I can share my, let's see if I can do that. Um, is this visible, Willem, for you guys? Yes, visible, very okay. much. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, well, just to give you an idea about what the podcast is all about, it's everything that's related to media, but it really broad sense. So it's about a creative industry, it's about Korean pop, it's, it's about behind the scenes, it's about sex robots, tracking, uh, the representation of female orgasm, internet archives, copy culture. Uh, so it's a really broad, uh, uh, broad topics. And what we do from the start is that we invite uh, colleagues, media scholars, and over the years, we invited over 80 different people who actually have a PhD, because in the title we are called media doctors. So uh, that's one pre uh, prerequisite to be a guest in our show. And we started off in actually a radio studio. And here you see a picture. And what we did in when you are in a studio, especially where you are standing up, is that your your voice starts to become this daytime radio show jockey. Uh, so we're putting a lot of energy in the microphone and here's our guest and we're very glad he's here and he's uh, here to talk about. So this was this really high energy and we found out that it's not actually what a podcast should be, uh, that a podcast should be more laid back and that you're actually speaking in someone's ear directly. So um, the next step for us was that we ended up in a television studio here in Amsterdam and he had these robo cams and uh, with this chroma key in in, in uh, on the back, and all of a sudden, after being a radio show, we pretended to be a television show. So we had makeup and all these kinds of different things. Oh, this is my CD. Um, and that also didn't felt very good because we learned along the way in the last few years that for us, a podcast is actually. Uh, a conversation and not so much a Q and A with uh, with an expert. So we scaled it down a little, and this is where we are now. In uh, just to have a recorder and uh, two or three mics, and that's it. And we, uh, I heard you tell uh, Willem that what we also did in the beginning is have this script, this four or five page script, and asking, uh, coming up with all the uh, questions up front and having this uh, conversation with our guests beforehand. And what we did over the years is making this script shorter and shorter and shorter. And our episodes became longer and longer and longer. And one of the reasons is that especially scholars, and I think a lot of you will, uh, uh, will have that experience, when you're interviewed by a journalist, normally you have like five or six minutes and you have these two or three talking points, and you have to be absolutely sure of what you're saying. And what we're trying to do with the guest we are inviting is uh, to have a conversation with us, the two of us, and actually wonder about a certain topic. 
um, uh, and, and not knowing and doubting about what what good uh, answers are. So we don't expect our uh, experts that that they know, but we ask them to think with us about certain topics. And you saw the broadness of the different topics that we that we have. It's not all. It's not always about one certain research or uh, one publication. But we ask the expert who can actually share thoughts uh, about a certain uh, topic. And Vincent, can I um, ask a question? Of course. I'm curious because if you have a very structured podcast uh, format where you have a script, you can imagine that it's quite a lot of preparation. And what you've described is a, a sort of making making the format looser. Yep. Um, but at the same time, you indicated that the outcome was that the podcast was sometimes longer. Um, so in your new format, does it does it does it mean less preparation or is it the same amount of preparation or perhaps even more preparation to have that spontaneity? It, it, it's true that uh, it's take, it takes a lot of time to write a short letter, isn't it? Uh, and it's the same with with the podcast. If you want, to, we, we are you still there? Um, oh, oh yeah, there you are. Um, we we used to edit it uh, to edit the show to twenty five minutes, and it's really hard to make those choices. And if you're an interviewer and you have to be strict on time, you lose a lot of new ideas, uh, 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 other conversations, pieces that. Uh, you didn't bring up or didn't thought of uh, at the beginning. So we chose to have a show that's between 45 and even longer minutes, all depending how interesting the guest is. So all the shorter episodes are with the less intriguing and less interesting guests, but they're all over one hour. So it's it's that freedom that's, that's really inviting for the scholars, the specialists uh, to actually uh, uh, have the time to to explain their thoughts and their doubts uh, about a certain topic, and not com all, only coming up with strict and 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 uh, uh, just one answer to a certain question. So we chose to have this freedom and to have this what's being called the kitchen table conversation, and really to trying to be intimate with our guests and also with the listener. So also trying with our voice to be more intimate, slower, maybe a bit lower. Someone said it gives you more authority, but it's also nicer not to scream in the microphone. But having this this open conversation with people who are expert in a certain field. That's what we chose to do. And, um, and so there's a question that's come in, which I think follows nicely. Um, so what do your listeners think about these longer episodes? Do you find that they're more popular with the listeners? This well, is a question from our Liverpool um, participant. Yeah, they are. Uh, and people tend to listen the whole episode. And I know from international research into podcasts that longer episodes are more favorable by listeners than shorter episodes. So uh, when we were 25 minutes, we hadn't had the reach that we do now. Uh, so you can, the, the most popular independent podcast in the Netherlands now that's that's totally independent is The Eeuw van de Amateur. They talk for t over two hours about nothing, but uh, it's it's really popular. Uh, just, just to add uh, to that, uh, Vincent, there's quite a couple of legal scholars here. And this yeah. was something that I also uh, came across um, when I started the podcast and that I, I'm still struggling with at times, mm -hmm. is... Um, lawyers have the tendency, and perhaps I'm generalizing, um, to, to sometimes feel like they can't be fully free on what to say or that they want to be very precise with their words, right? Yeah. They don't want to be, that one, I don't think any of us like to be wrong, but like they definitely don't want to say that something that is not in line with jurisprudence and stuff. So um, what I was wondering is, so you've moved kind of from very structured to, um, to, to More loose, being probably. very free. Yep. And are there ways or techniques that you can still, um, how much preparatory work do you do? Is that an A4 or is it, uh, a, do you have absolutely no discussion prior anymore? Or, or what do you do to actually ease the minds of, of the people that are on you, of the doctors that are on your show? Well, sometimes there hasn't, of course, because there is no strict uh, script and uh, they have to adapt to that. But 
uh, we always give them the opportunity if they said something they're really, really uh, uh, unsure about, we can take it out. But we don't edit the show anymore. We use filters and and and, and clean up the sound. But uh, it's an open discussion. So um, I don't think that podcast is if if it's a one way, if it's a lecture. Uh, a 25 minute lecture that's one of the formats that you could use but it's not i think not the most interesting way to talk about certain uh, scientific topics is that an answer to your question yeah totally for sure yeah, yeah it's, a, it's um, a bit of it's a bit of letting go i think but that's that's difficult i think in general as academics but also as uh, as lawyers particularly yeah, and the interesting thing is that we as scholars or scientists who are asked to do an interview are most of the time a bit hesitant or insecure about what is the interviewer going to ask. So what we do, we call our guest and explain to them that we want to have a conversation as we would have at a kitchen table about where their expertise lies. And if then it's an open discussion. That's why we have uh, we have a, me and my co-host are doing it. One of them is keeping track of time more or less, and the other one is more functioning as a sidekick. And we switch that uh, every two weeks. So there's always conversation, and uh, most of our guests find that really refreshing to actually have the uh, the time to uh, come up with. Uh, a longer narrative about their uh, field of expertise and not giving these short, clear answers that they have to do in these four or five minute interviews. Um, well, during the last few years, we were we, we loosened up the, a little. Um, in, in production terms, uh, I can share this with you. Uh, we always worked with uh, volunteers. And that's always very uh, useful. Um, here they are, if you can see them. Um, these are all students coming from um, media departments or philosophy department. There's a musician there who is very good with audio, of course. And as a gimmick, we're wearing, uh, we're dressed up like doctors, but not a useful kind. And uh, this is one our 100th uh, episode that we had a few months ago. And we invited all the people who were guests on our show. This was a really nice evening. And uh, I heard a few questions about statistics and what you can know and what you can't know. Um, I'm willing to share our statistics if you want to. Um, this is the last week for us. And what you can see, can you read it? Is, is this clear? Um, that you see that it's different every day. Uh, and here you can see where people are coming from. Well, uh, of course, from the Netherlands, but also more international and mostly Amsterdam because we're an Amsterdam based podcast, but both working in Utrecht. And here you can see a few things about uh, SoundCloud embedded player. So if you use that piece of HTML code and put it on your website, uh, people can also listen to it. Um, and now we're going back. Um, a few other things that I noticed in the, f uh, the, the other podcast makers is uh, that Actually, the whole the whole idea about preparation that that's really important, of course, but opening up to having these well funny little accidents during your interview or going a different way is it's that's I think more uh, interesting to listen to. I listen to podcasts quite a lot. Uh, uh, the Daily, New York Times, Every Day um, with Michael Barbero. Um, I think that's a great show. And it's also about soundscaping. Uh, we haven't mentioned that yet, but there's a lot you can do with letting people by audio know where you are uh, uh, using the sound of paper or uh, uh, there are people using uh, uh, drinking beers during a podcast. You shouldn't do that as a lawyer, but doing other things just to let uh, the people know where you are more or less. This uh, uh, create an atmosphere in your podcast. 
And from a technical standpoint, we were discussing microphones and all these kind of things. I think one of the most important things about the technical aspect about your podcast is not so much the uh, the expensive microphone, but the room you're sitting in. Uh, when you're in a in a room that's that's absorbing all the noise, it's so much better than when you're doing it in your bathroom. Uh, what I learned is if you clap your hands and you can hear it directly back to your ears, it's not a good room. So uh, you can have a really cheap microphone in a good room and your sound will be better than a really expensive microphone in a shitty environment. Um, are there any questions? Um, yes, there are actually. Um, I've got a question. Can you say a little bit about your co-host and the dynamics between you two? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, my co-host is, uh, is coming from communication science. And, well, we like to disagree with each other. Also on a personal level in the podcast, it gives more dynamic uh, conversation. We actually like each other, but in the podcast, we we like to um, well confront each other with different perspective on a certain topic. Especially when you are having a guest who is coming from a certain to to open up the discussion more, and and to see where uh, where it leads us. So our we have, as I said, there is one uh, who is more the presenter of the show. The other is a sidekick. So there's one who has to keep track of time and, and certain questions but the other one is more free to break in uh, to comment asking questions uh, <coughs> um, apart from the script there, there's another question from Gert who's asking about the statistics that you showed um, and asking whether your website or app requires cookies to get those statistics no, those the, the we use SoundCloud as a host for our audio files, and within SoundCloud you need to have a uh, a pro account, I think, uh, that will generate your statistics. So, even if you want to use iTunes or all the other uh, uh, platforms, you need a place to host your audio files. Apple is not hosting your audio files. I'm so sorry. Um, the other thing, the question was, do you need a website? No, I don't think you need a website. Uh, we think it's nice to have a website. It's also an archive for us to see what we have done. It's nice if you want to invite someone to your podcast, you can send them to your website and let them see what you're all about in your podcast. But I don't see that it's, it's really necessary. Um, and we discussed this before, Willem, that the whole idea of a podcast is, is because it's so low tech, actually, you can start right away and you should do that and distribute it and make mistakes and uh, wait for the responses of other people. But I'm not that fond of rehearsing or doing two or three episodes and not uh, uh, not sharing it with the world. It's 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 nice to be, to be transparent about your own production process. And if something goes wrong, share it with the audience. They like it to hear that your audio was fucked up and uh, you come back to that and you try to do it better the next time. That's, 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 that's also the charm. And, uh, well, that's what podcasting makes it uh, romantic, actually. <coughs> See, just... um, I have a question, uh, again, just to pull some strands together that we've already heard from other... Yeah podcast makers about structure um you've talked about how you know you like it to be loose but within that looseness are there any certain characteristics that you have like Willem talked about he always asked the same opening question and the same final question we um, always start with a question and try to answer that question by the end of the podcast and we have one over 100 episodes and i don't think we succeeded once uh, to actually come up with a question because they're the really broad questions about, uh, well, everything that's related to media, but it gives some sort of academic structure to what we're doing. 
Right. And would they ever be based on an article? I mean, if you invited a guest, would it be because you'd seen that they wrote an article? Um, that might be another way of giving it a structure that, you know. Yeah, what we're trying to do is if we see that someone uh, published a, a certain article, uh, is that we like to broaden up the theme of that article. So we had a, well, let's see if this, the website, uh, the, the tracking mechanisms in, in media. Uh, we discussed it before uh, concerning Zoom. We saw that someone uh, published an article about tracking. Then we make an episode in a broad sense about tracking and our guest is able to bring up their own research to say, well, this is what I found out. Great. That's what we're doing. And uh, well, we used uh, at, at, at a certain point, we also had webcams and all these other things. And because we have all these volunteers who were actually able to to edit all this uh, uh, video as well, uh, and we put it on YouTube, it was a total failure. Because uh, the reach that we have with an episode, only audio is over, well, let's say 2000. And there were like 50 or 60 people watching it on YouTube. It's totally boring, of course, to see people with headphones on in front of a mic. So don't bother to put it on YouTube. Um, financially, did we talk money already? Uh, we've I briefly you touched upon it. How much it costs to edit? But you seem to do that yourself. So I we do it ourselves, and uh, we're using a, uh, a Zoom H6 recorder. Uh, that's a really popular recorder for uh, podcast makers, and you can use regular microphones with them. You can use up to four or six, depending on the model of your uh, recorder. And the presets on that recorder are quite good. So what we do is that we put it on an SD card and put it in a uh, Final Cut Pro, for example, or Audacity and using certain fields. So there's not a lot of work in editing these episodes. Um, but we are fortunate to have uh, our volunteers who are happy to do it for us. So and they're more knowledgeable about audio than we are, we as hosts. So uh, if you don't have someone in your environment, I can imagine that you would use a service like it was mentioned before. Um, but editing is not that hard to do. About intros, uh, Willem, you said you use a, uh, a theme song or a jingle or, um, well, the whole new thing in, in, in podcasts is the cold opening. Um, just start talking um, and, and, and explain what you're doing. And uh, what you see is what's really popular now is sharing this, how you're, where you're sitting. Uh, I'm looking outside to share something about your environment and doing your jingle after that 15 seconds of cold opening. That's really a genre thing now in podcast making. And uh, we all know that if you're coming to the end, an, a final jingle or a theme song, well, you can actually skip that because people won't listen to the last 20 seconds of your podcast because when you say, well, thank you for listening, that's the time that people press stop or pause and doing other things. So don't bother about uh, uh, sharing your credits or uh, uh, all these kinds of jingles. Uh, you can do it for your sponsor. We have a sponsor who is paying the hosting costs for us. Uh, for us, it's I think it's like four or five hundred euros a year max that we need for this little bit of equipment, hosting, all these uh, pro accounts on the SoundCloud and other things uh, to make this podcast to our website, the website designer uh, who is doing that. So it can be done on a really small budget. There's one more question, Vincent, from Birgit. Um, I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, do you actively use your podcast in courses? Well, uh, I don't. Uh, There's it, 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 a, a bit of vanity in there that you should listen to my podcast. I mentioned it to students, but I know that other colleagues or uh, guests who come up uh, on our show or podcast use it for their own students. 
and it's it's been used in different uh, uh, universities. I know it's uh, mandatory in Leuven. Uh, 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 quite a few episodes of us. Right. Are there any other questions? Well, my best advice is just start podcasting and doing with what you have. Don't bother buying expensive microphones. You can use your own uh, iPhone. And if you're fed up with a bad sound, you will start buying mics. But the hardest part is actually doing it. And not so much uh, the technicalities of it, not so much uh, the topics. You're all uh, specialists in your own field, but actually doing it and sharing it with the world, that's, that seems to be the hardest part for a lot of people. There, there's one more question. I, I guess it's probably for everybody um, who's spoken. Uh, well, actually, we've only got, uh, so Willem and Vincent are the only ones who are university employees making podcasts. Does the university support you um, in making the podcasts? Well, they do pay my salary. So in, in that sense, uh, no, I don't get support, technical support or any other way. Uh, I wouldn't want that. Uh, I, and, and I see this podcast as an independent podcast, uh, that it's not associated with my work. I'm doing that as a media scholar, but not as a Utrecht University media scholar. So I think there's a difference with what Willem is doing. Is it? Well... Um, it's a good question, actually. Uh, I, I suppose I feel like it's more integrated in my work at the moment. So it's just part and parcel of the activities that I chose. It's an optional one. No one forced me to do it, obviously. Um, but in terms of support, I did get some type of funding. It was very limited, but some uh, initially to buy the equipment and later on for some editing funds. I'm do noticing, though, is that it's really up and coming. But even within Utrecht, and I'm hearing the same sounds in, in, within other universities, it doesn't really fit the mold, right? So there's very often, uh, there's not a lot of, not a lot of support. Uh, but if you go look for it, it there will definitely be some, I think. Um, and I think that's also a nice link to, to move to, um, uh, to our final speaker of today, uh, René Hendricks, uh, who I'll give the floor now. And he's um, actually, we got in touch because... Uh, Catherine and I, in, in light of the Legal Skills Academy that she was talking about, uh, went and looked for um, uh, for some means. Is there support? What can you do at Utrecht? Are there recording studios, etc.? Or do you just have to, like Vincent was saying, you have to just grab your iPhone or buy a, buy that mic? Um, and then we found out that there are actually two two podcast uh, studios. So in terms of support at Utrecht University, it's it's getting there. Um, so can I give the the floor to you, uh, Rene? And of course, a big thanks to to Vincent uh, for for sharing his ex his experiences. It's nice to highlight the the achievements and also the the stuff that you don't think people should do. And I think that's very valuable uh, very valuable advice. All right, I see that Rene has taken charge. All right, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is René Hendricks. I'm from the audiovisual department of the Utrecht University. And I take this chance to promote our department because management said we were invisible. So, um, probably because they don't know what we do. Um, normally we support 350 lecture rooms and 100 meeting rooms and three DIY studios for video. And we have one podcast studio and the Faculty of Humanities has also one podcast studio. So uh, they were asking us for uh, to, to build a podcast studio, which for us was quite novel because we more our, how do you call it in English, graffiti point, sweat point, lays on video. So, and audio was quite new for us. And humanities uh, is more uh, centered to, towards audio. But we started from the Faculty of Social Sciences, which, which, which uh, uh, uses a lot of video in their uh, education. 
Um, so, got to make a search for a podcast studio. And yeah, you start with saying, what, what should it be? What do we need? What do we want? What, not what we want, but what uh, does our clients want? So we needed a place for four people. We thought that was max for, for a podcast. Uh, we need to uh, have the possibilities to make recordings from a phone. This, not everyone is uh, able to come to Utrecht uh, to the studio. And we can now uh, use phones, inserting intros and music. It has to be professional gear, but also easy to use. And it's a bit of a contradiction of, uh, of them both. But I think we manage it. So we started with the, the, the simple stuff. The easy stuff we could find, and that's a microphone. So we, we bought microphones, quite good ones, very expensive, something to hang them around, and a headphone. So we had probably uh, very nice uh, head headsets, <laughs> which you usually uh, connect to your phone. They're quite uh, so. Then came the difficult part. We will when we start googling on the podcast studios, uh, and besides the microphones and headphones, we need a mixer. So where the sounds come in and then goes out, and then you get this kind of stuff. Um, they're great, great things, but not for easy use. It's a do-it-yourself uh, podcast studio, by the way. And we start Googling uh, podcast studios. And we came to this kind of pictures with a technician board. Here also. And even in Lekkerland, they uh, use a uh, technician. So that's not really the, the road we were trying to go. So when you cook on easy, uh, simple podcast, you get this kind of stuff. It was maybe a bit too simple. Um, but luckily we found uh, a mixer was built especially for recording podcasts. And that's this one. And if you think this is intimidating, Remember this one. On this one, you have the four microphones you can connect. You can connect a, a phone to cable or Bluetooth, and you can connect the computer. And there are a lot of uh, big recording button and eight smaller buttons. And maybe you're familiar with uh, Lubach on Sondag. Yes, yes, when he pushes on the button, he gets a sound. Um, luckily, we have, we thought, hey, this looks more like a radio uh, studio than a podcast studio. Of course, you can live put your jingles in or your music or whatever you want to put in. That was nice, and you can, we have, uh, I don't know if that's working. Uh, you should hear now sound. It was a keynote presentation that's converted to PowerPoint. So let's see if I can use this one. No. Well, we have uh, jingles. You can put your own jingles in. You can have very cheesy uh, recordings like Laughing Public or whatever. 
you can have ambient uh, sounds like uh, play your uh, playground chill and playground or as you wrote or rain dropping or whatever you want you cannot all do live during your podcast it helps with uh, post-production so uh, you don't need to have to put it later in And this is how it looks in the flesh. It's uh, not the most exciting room, but it's uh, damp, very good damp, and it's very cozy. Not so smart on uh, Corona times, but maybe we have to change this uh, for maximum for two people and uh, put in big pieces of plastic, but we don't know yet. People seem to like it. We just started off in, when was this, late February. They really liked it. Uh, they liked it, 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 the stuff, the, the, the quality, and they were happy that there was some room on, on the Eithof and not only in the, in the in town. Um, Can, there was also a, a computer is installed, but you can bring your own computer. And we use uh, Audacity and Adobe Audition as uh, software to record it to it. On Audition, you can record multi-track. So that's every microphone and sound is on a different uh, track. And Audacity makes a, a one stereo. When you're very comfortable, you can use that. Uh, René, just to, uh, just to briefly interrupt. Sorry, there's a question that popped in from uh, Gert and Tom. Um, he was wondering if this setup that you just showed everyone uh, of the podcast studio at the Uithof is the same as the one on the Kolme Nuregracht. And um, uh, he was wondering what your location is at the Science Park. We are at... Uh, at the moment, on, at the Bologna line, that's uh, in the direction of uh, veterinary uh, faculty. Um, and we're trying to get room in the Bestuursgebouw. So we want to be more in the middle. Um, what do I say? Oh, yeah. And also, you can. Also bring, of course, your own computer and uh, lock it to the mixer. And at the Kromme Graag, they have the same mixer. I don't know if they have the same microphones or so, but the mixer is the same. I just, just to add to that, uh, Catherine and I visited that other room recently. Uh, the mixer is the same, like you say, the microphones are a little bit different, but I think it's it's the same similar setup. I mean, the microphones are on yeah. a stand instead of one of these big hangers, but the facility seems, in terms of quality, seems very similar. And, uh, and to be um, to be clear, for those of you who are Utrecht uh, employees here, there are two studios in the Krommer Nieuwegracht, the, the DIY studio and the podcast studio. And you need to go to the podcast studio because it's quite different from the DIY studio, and it's yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's the podcast studio that has this um, this kit that you're being shown in the photographs. Yeah. Now the DIY is it's a DIY podcast studio, but we also have DIY video uh, studios, and that's more for um, why do we call it Kenneth clips or Eddie clips we made with video which I don't see why you can't make uh, clips with uh, just audio so that's that's useful for that through and, um, and because we can record uh, phones very good uh, we, we like that because we could we got a uh, sometimes questions so I need to uh, interview someone and I need to record this my phone uh, conversation. How do I do that? And, and this way, it's, it's a perfect way to do that. It's very simple. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, costs, it, it's free. So, cost you nothing. 
you can you can make a reservation in this uh, email address or telephone or mail formula or from FSC, and you can use it for free. So no costs are intended. Just a question from my side. What is oh exactly? It's the right sheet to ask the question. Um, what's um what's the availability at the moment in terms of what's your like? Is it fully booked out all the time, or would you say there's still quite some room in the in the agenda for for people wanting to start with podcasts? It's quite a bit. That's quite, no, there's quite a bit of room. And when you say at the moment, Willem, you obviously mean like not during this coronavirus time. No, I, 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 I apologize. I just nearly, I lost track of where I was in what world. I was just getting excited about podcasting. My, my apologies. In in a year's time, is there availability, Rene? Yeah. Oh, yes. I, I, I hope it's very busy. We, we built a second one. It's no problem. Because uh, it's very little money when you compare it to a video studio. So <laughs> it's peanuts. All right. Are there any other questions for, for Rene? So it does, it does seem like that Utrecht University uh, supports this, this uh, trend of podcasting in science, I think, uh, even though it's still like at a starting stage. Um, I think um, any questions for, for Rene still? Okay, well, then this is the risky bit that Vincent uh, highlighted already. As soon as you say thank you, people tune out. Some of you, some have uh, had to go to other duties and they said they said massive thanks in the, in the, in the chat box already. Um, I think what's interesting is that the, this, uh, the experiences so far and also the stuff that Utrecht University has, has been offering, um, it really highlights that there's different ways of going about it and there's different phases of the podcasting process. <laughs> And that's really interesting, I think, um, also for people that are starting to, 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 to begin something in this podcasting uh, world uh, that goes for structure, for audio editing. Um, but I think what, was, what I really appreciated is some of the failures, if I may call them like that, was things that people struggled with. Because I think it's also like it's not just uh, easy all the time. It's, it's a learning process for us as academics. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to, to highlight still. Um, and uh, before we actually leave, is there anything, Catherine, that you would like to close off with? No, I think a, a lot has been covered. Um, so I, um, there's, I have no further questions. Perhaps um, it, this is your last call for those of you who are in the chat. If there are any burning questions, now's your last uh, opportunity. But of course, you can also get in touch with people over, um, over email. For sure. And just uh, one last thing um, about the, uh, the the recording. I'll post that online. And I think Catherine and I will try to see, even though we haven't discussed this yet, but I'm sure she'll she'll be up for it, is to do a small wrap up of this, this meetup. Because I think particularly in these COVID times, it's nice to be able to share. If people have knowledge, let's help each other out a little bit. So let's see uh, what we can come up with afterwards. Uh, I really appreciated all your questions. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, a massive thanks to all the speakers. Uh, Vincent, Gazale, uh, Bob, um, and Rene, and of course also uh, Catherine. Uh, great that, that we all managed to put this online. Um, and let's um, uh, we and that's one final call to action. Uh, let us know if you start something. We'd love to know about your endeavors and, and what you come up with. Thank you so much, and um, uh, let's uh, let's keep in touch. Great. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Mm-hmm.